These are the windows that not only make a sanctuary beautiful, but often tell a history. The beauty of a stained glass window in a church is often expected as part of the atmosphere. But how often do you wonder about how the beauty is created or even preserved? Today on Austin Faith Dialogue, we'll look beyond the simple beauty of the stained glass windows in your place of worship and look at the hard work that goes into each one of them. This is Austin Faith Dialogue, a public affairs program discussing the important crossroad of religion in life, produced by Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KTBC-TV. Austin Faith Dialogue highlights the interaction of the religious community with the social and cultural issues throughout our area. Now, today's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Good day, I'm Roger Lotz, and your host for today's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. It is said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Here in Austin, one's eye will sparkle with wonder when you tour any place of worship. That wonder comes from the beautiful stained glass windows that exist throughout our area. Today we will look and discuss how that beauty comes about, and even more important, how it is preserved for future generations. But first, let's tour the Austin area and take a view of the special sites that can be seen. During our tour, we gained some insight of stained glass from Dean Zelmer and Pastor Carl Gronberg of Gethsemane Lutheran Church. They discussed their church's stained glass, but their words ring true for all the window art we're about to show you. The video was shot by cameraman Tracy Poe. this was installed, the choir people said it was like an inspiration to them in their singing, because wherever they looked, there was a story. And wherever the light was coming through, it felt like God was present. I think the organist told me that when she comes and practices now, during the week, that she sits and looks at these windows and she can't stop looking at them because of what they're saying. The church building, to me as a worship leader, is a place that reminds those who come, the faithful congregants who come to worship, reminds us of the, um, the sacredness of life, that life is a holy gift of God, and that these windows, these stained glass windows, uh, reveal that type of sacred message, a message that's been handed down for generations through the ancient scriptures, these are all biblical stories, and these stories in the stained glass windows talk about God's interaction with humanity, calling humanity to, to an awareness of the beauty, the wonder, the glory, and the faithfulness of God, and the opportunity for our human beings to respond to this God of grace and this God of mercy. For in a society like ours that is so much geared to, to seeing things, that the stained glass windows tell that ancient story and they speak not only to a modern society but they speak to uh, all ages of people you come in here at different times during the year and you'll see different realities of the windows they speak they do come alive and at different times during the day because of the illumination always there is that changing that goes on but whether it's a church building where people worship or a cathedral where people worship it's all to the glory of god and that's what I think I feel and sense and I'm aware of when we come together, that whether it's the pipe organ or the choir or the reading of the scripture or the stained glass, all of them speak a message of, of God's revelation, of God's grace and love. You can look at these individual um, pictures, if you will, or stories, and uh, you will find something in them that's different every time you look at them. 
And when you read the biblical stories themselves and look at the windows, then you can begin to understand how, they're de how the, the artist designed them. Because there are so many uh, things in the windows that he has put there that we don't know about, that it's an, uh, an ongoing study of um, the story of God. And that's what makes these windows so interesting, is it makes you read the story. We are now joined by two people who know more than a thing or two about religious stained glass windows. For them, it has become more than a vocation. It's an advocation of love. Our first guest is architect Ben Heimstath of Clovis Heimstath Architects. He has become a specialist in regards to constructing and preserving religious stained glass in various houses of worship throughout central Texas and throughout the country, as I'm told. Also joining Ben is his mom, Mary Ann Heimstath, who has become a very well-known interior designer in the same field. And of course, she also specializes in designing stained glass windows. We thank you both for joining us this morning. And we have a lot on our plate this morning since we've decided to go into a topic that has a lot of variety to it, as well as some things that I guess stay the same throughout all of them. Um, when we talk about stained glass, and we're going to get to some examples in just a moment, but for me, when you grow up in a church or in a synagogue and, and you see the stained glass, you just expect it there. But what kind of work goes into it. I mean, take me through the process quickly, if we can, from point A to, I guess, point B, when it's finally there. How does one go about it? Well, I think if we could start off by saying stained glass is an architectural element. Um, it's really a two-fold element because it paints a picture. Certainly there are images in the glass, but it also controls the light. And I think one of the things that were brought up in the video we just saw, what light does, and what light does in coming through the glass in the varying qualities of light, gives you a very ethereal quality in your church. And I think one of the reasons why we have stained glass in our churches, and we continue to use stained glass in our churches, is that when you walk into the church, and you see the color, and you see what the light does to the space, you feel the presence of God. You feel a holiness. It gives you a sacred experience. But how it actually happens is really very simple. Stained glass windows in the very beginning, when they, when they made stained glass windows in the Middle Ages, they had these very small pieces of glass, and they put them together with pieces of lead, and it's called a lead cane. The section of it is almost like an H, so it kind of grabs the pieces of glass. Well, when they started making stained glass windows, they had clear glass, and they had it in different colors. The colors are really caused by the minerals in the glass, and I believe that by putting different minerals in, you make different colors, but I think very often uh, they were in the sands that they actually melted down for the glass. But they ended up with these small pieces of glass, which they could put together in these patterns into pictures, and of course in the medieval cathedrals and in the old churches, I think you have to realize a lot of people who worship there couldn't read. So many of the stained glass stories or pictures were Bible stories, that the image told the story, but then the light coming through the window and the light coming through at different times of year and different times of day illuminated the space, made the impression of the window. So you really have, it's twofold. One of the things that has happened over the years is that in this clear glass, uh, you were getting light coming through, and depending on the thickness of the glass, you got a certain amount of light. But then someone discovered you could paint on the glass. And so what they did, they actually took a pigmented glass, a colored glass, ground it all up into a fine powder, put it on the glass in a pattern, and then fired it so that it became, it melted into, and it was fused with that piece of glass. And so as the windows were getting a little more sophisticated, the light was controlled by the amount of paint on the glass. Then they were able to paint images on the glass. In fact, we finally got into the 19th century where some of the glass, in fact, some of the things you'll see today in the images from the Austin churches are actual pictures painted on the glass. So in a way, here's a question that has always intrigued me. Is it an art or is it a craft putting together one of these things? And I mean, I know that there's a similarity between the two, but I mean, 
an art art form talks you you think more of a painting or or a sculpture and a craft you think more of of, of something finely done like a, a wonderful cabinet or, or or such what what is it oh you've asked a wonderful question and I think one <laughs> that we could talk about for another whole program but I think the technical craft of putting the stained glass window together that is a craft how the glass is cut how it is soldered how it's put together but the design of the glass is an art now where that kind of gets fuzzy is when you start painting on glass you could have a technically proficient craftsman who knew exactly how to mix the glass and how to fuse it and fire it but you need an artist who is going to paint it so that the line gives you that artistic quality so i think you need both well you've been doing this for a while and i'm going to ask ben the general question why did you get involved in stained glass <laughs> i mean as an, as an architect there are buildings to be made houses houses to be built why stained glass well I, I think that we've already had a discussion of how stained glass is integral to the conception of the space and if we go back to the origin of stained glass in western architecture uh, it happens to be an extremely well documented beginning where the glass and the architectural movement for the gothic cathedrals all came together at the same time it's integrally tied into our idea of theology uh, in france in the twelfth century uh, a very well-placed abbot at saint denis became fascinated with the transcendent quality of the glass and he devised gothic architecture as a way of bringing more and more of this instruction glass as he called it he wrote and the dedication that he was looking for the vera lumina or the true light lamps as he called these stained glass glowing uh, fixtures to help direct minds to see the vera lux the true light or god as he was calling it and he had a mystical association with stained glass that generated the kinds of spaces that in a small chapel he was able to put together under his tutelage as the abbot of saint denis that caught on and with a hundred years all over europe the drive to having larger and larger expanses of glass and having more and more spaces that were crafted as transcendent total spaces uh, has has obviously influenced western architecture uh, from that time on so it's it's more of a challenge for you to see how you can improve upon the old masters in a way it's keeping that tradition alive and making it fresh in the united states we drew upon western european traditions and in fact many of the earliest stained glass installations in texas would have come straight from europe uh, the architects however were uh, time and again testing and working this ability of the, the, the coloring of the light and the creating of focus and pictures in the stained glass to craft those spaces into something special so that upon entering any church in central texas for the past hundred years one oftentimes because of the stained glass or with the the stained glass integral to the space one knows that they're in a place that's very special now we have some examples and we're going to go to to uh, the monitor and and those of you at home are going to be seeing this on your screen and we have this first uh stained glass here and either one of you can this help this is the rose window at saint mary's cathedral and it's interesting because there's a history of rose windows and they are generally broken up into sections of 12 and you had the 12 disciples you had the 12 tribes of israel uh even the 12 signs of the zodiac so when this we... window is broken up into 16 and ben and i were very curious to know why nicholas clayton who was the architect for the cathedral chose 16. Uh, it might be that it was just a pretty good geometry to work with and of course these are not pictorial they are decorative but they do create a beautiful light with the stone ribs in between as you walk into the cathedral. So I guess the message from a stained glass window like this is that there is always a message in there, as, as simplistic or as... as I would say this is no a window that there, is controlling the light. And in controlling the light, it is giving you the ambience of the color. But there definitely is not a picture. There aren't symbols in this window. Now, you'll see many of the windows that are going to come up will actually have and, symbols in And we have one there that does have a picture on it. Now, I was talking earlier about painting and painting on windows. Uh, 
the, the interesting thing about this window is that it's a very beautiful face, and the drapery on her dress, if you notice there, is painted. Uh, one technique of painting is, as I said, they grind, all these paints are made with ground-up glass, and this is put on the glass piece, and it's fired. Now, it's terribly important if you don't fire it at the right temperature, you're going to lose the shape of your glass because the glass under layman will melt. So it's very critical you get the right temperature. And also, if you're working with colors, the heat will change the colors. This is a very beautiful face. Ben, now, if you can tell me, where was that last one taken? Just that was at St. Mary's. These are these all St. Mary's. These, are, these the three are. And now, this is the window of the main altar at St. Mary's. And the interesting thing about this, and I'd like you to remember it in relation to the next one we'll see at St. David's, is the drapery is on the Virgin is painted. Now, that is all. It was blue glass to start with, and then the black was painted on it. Probably the piece of blue glass was painted with the black and then it was rubbed off to bring the blue through, which would be different from what was done on the face or the hands where that molding was probably painted directly on. And this is a prime example of a storytelling window. It certainly Absolutely. is a storytelling window. Notice also the architectural pieces have been represented in the stained glass. So you have a church building that's holding up the stained glass, but in stained glass, the borders oftentimes were made architectural elements. Again, an understanding that this is critical to the architecture. It also was a trick they were using to try to make the glowing glass more and more three-dimensional. Oftentimes, the old stained glass artists understood that receding colors would make backgrounds and brighter colors would make foregrounds. And uh, in the days before MTV, that was the way to knock people's socks off when they took a look at this kind of thing and saw the three-dimensionality. And I guess let's knock our socks off with the next one that we have. And now this is, this is a larger view. You see the altar and you see the two stained glass. Now we're in St. David's this, Episcopal This is St. David's Episcopal. And you can see that the windows are controlling the light. They're almost giving you kind of a blue light up. It depends a lot what time of day you walk in there, but I think that the feeling when you walk into St. David's is very cool and, and, and very holy, and those windows do it. The question I have been is, in some churches you can go in, and, and, and this might be a prime example of that, you can go in on the cloudiest of days, and you, I always thought that you could go in at night into a church, and there'll be more light in the sanctuary than there is outside. Does the stained glass, because of the refraction of the light, have that effect that it'll take what little light is on the outside, bring it in, and magnify it? No, it that, depends on where your to... light is. Well, yeah. If you have, you have a panel of stained glass, the side that has the most light, the light will come through. So during the day, if the most light is on the outside, you're going to see that color glowing inside. But at night, if you go into St. David's, you walk by the church, you'll see the color outside, and on the inside, the windows will look pretty much black. Now, to the extent that you have opalescent glass, that will reflect some of the light in on the interior. And one of the things we try to do in our windows, and I'm, I'll show you one of them, is we try to use enough opalescent glass so that the windows have a visible image, whether you are on the inside with a light shining or on the inside with a light outside. And we are going to have to stop at that point, but we're going to continue on, and we're going to take a short break at this point. And we'll be back with more Austin Faith Dialogue right after this. Stay with us. Serving Austin means serving you. That has always been the primary goal of Austin Metropolitan Ministries. We are a religion in action through the work of these organizations. Each plays a key role in making the capital city a better place to live. But we can't do it alone. Do you have some spare time, talents, or any resources that you can share? If you do, please call AMM at 472-7627 because serving Austin means serving you. back on Austin Faith Dialogue. Today we are looking and talking about the work behind stained glass windows and we have two guests with us. Ben Highsmith, his mother Mary Heimstath. I I'm apologize about that last name. Boy, second time today that I've done this. First time off the air but 
second time on the air. And you both specialize in stained glass windows. And before we went to the break, we were going through a number of the different stained glass windows. And let's continue on with that, if we can. Uh, this is the next one that I believe we had. And why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Well, if you remember before I was telling you, we started out with a clear glass, and then they learned how to paint on the glass with this pigment, which is actually glass melted on. And finally, we got to the point where the artists were painting pictures on glass. We were really losing a little quality of our stained glass window because this was really a picture painted on the glass. If you just isolate that picture, the light coming through it is really not doing very much for the space. Now, of course, it's set in all these other pieces of glass, which are still doing, but we're losing, we're really losing the stained glass quality. So the effect is not truly there. Now, there was the quite a reaction to this, and I think Ed, in the... When yeah, we should, we should point out, this is actually carried over from the 17th and 18th century in Europe, where canvas yes. painters became stained glass painters and signed their work for the first time. So if we go on to the next one, I think you'll see what I mean. Now, this is a window at St. David's. It is a Tiffany window. It's a very beautiful window. One of the things that Tiffany was able to do was to make his own glass. And rather than using the clear glass and painting on it, he was able to make an opalescent or a semi-translucent glass with a variety of colors. So the drapery on the angel and the wings are not painted on. The variation in color there comes from the glass itself. Sometimes he even took two pieces of glass and he let them in, them in together like a sandwich so that he could get a variation of depth of color. So you're looking So at the only thing on this angel that's painted is her face and her hair and if you could see her hands. But the draperies and her wings are actually pieces of glass. The clouds up in the sky are glass that was actually made to look like that. It's so, not painted. So when you're looking at a stained glass window like this, you're looking at a number of different types of art forms coming together to make this stained right. glass Right, so window. there's a real art in actually making the glass and, and making the very, and then selecting the color out of that piece of glass. And then there's the art of painting on the glass and certainly the art of putting it all together. Well, and a, and a connection to theology in the sense that uh, Tiffany very strongly advertised that he was being closer to a pure form by doing as little painting as possible and by making the colors and textures out of the glass itself. He felt that was more true. And I believe we have some more that we can go on to. And this one here, and I found this very impressive because of, I guess, you have a form of light in front of a stained glass window that is another form of light. And notice how the, the, the assemblage of the structure of the stained glass, because they, at Central Christian here, would have saved their, all their funds for the more fantastic entry stained glass. This is just colored pieces set in a geometric pattern. But they didn't apologize for this being a simpler composition. They made it work with the uh, designed light fixture. All this was designed mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Roger White, I don't know for sure of his connection to the stained glass windows, but the composition of this whole space was done by a, a, a UT professor in the 1920s. And due to time, we're going to move along just a little bit. Here is another form, and I guess this is just a variance of that, because again, you have an element of the church in front of that stained glass. That, is that correct? Or That's correct. You have the lights. Of course, when the lights are lit, you can see the stained glass from the outside. But it's interesting, if you look at the face on this, this was a painted face. Uh, the rest of the window is not painted. They are pieces of glass that are leaded in. But if you look, this is a very contemporary looking window. This was done in the 20s or 30s. Mm -hmm. And you, you notice that there are no curves, that uh, they're basically angular pieces. We have an Art Deco stained glass And window. it's a really an Art Deco window. And I hate to say this, due to time, I, we're going to change a little bit, and I want to tell my producer this. I'm, we're going to go to some of the works that you have done so that you can describe some of the work that you have put together for us. How, how much time does it take for you to put a stained glass window together? I mean, that may sound like a well, the naive question. The, the process of design of the stained glass is just as uh, participatory as the, as the design of the worship space to begin with. Mary Ann will sit down with committee members and work through themes and symbols to get into exactly what each congregation is trying to accomplish with the stained glass. And if we can show the audience some of their work this would be something that you would put together. Yes, this is, a, this is one of six windows that in the dome of a cemetery chapel we did for Temple Emmanuel in Houston. And if you'll go on to the next picture, 
This is what stained glass does. There are six of these windows. As the sun moves in during the day and as it moves, the location of the sun changes during the year, the reflections from those windows are cast on the concrete walls and on the floor. All it's, through it's, the dome space, this is a, uh, all six it, sides of the dome. It's continually changing, and this is really what stained glass does. It's an image you can see, but it also creates an ambience with the light. And if we can move on to the next one, this would be... Would this be found on, on a ceiling? Or uh, no, this or, is a rose a window. This is a rose window in a Baptist church in South Carolina. It's an Old Testament rose window based on a system of 12. Uh, actually, we have 12 symbols there that represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the burning bush in the center, the image. Uh, in the windows I do, I try to get the feeling of the congregation, what they like to express. This is a Bible-oriented church, and, and they felt very strongly about the Old Testament. And that's very important to and get their input into a stained glass so that they feel like it's Oh, yes, you home. couldn't do it without their input. Then what I try to do is pick up the symbols that will relate. Now, this is another Old Testament window that was done for a Catholic congregation in Katy, Texas. Uh, we have the burning bush in the center, which I think is a very important symbol. Uh, the s waters of the Red Sea are surrounding that, and you see they've been parted as the people of Israel walked across into the Promised Land. And again, we have the 12 symbols for the 12 tribes of Israel. And just in closing, when, when you put something like this together, how long does it take for a project like this? Well, the, the design takes as long as a design takes. Generally, I would say it would be in design for about a month. Uh, by the time we're back and forth with the congregation and we come up with a design that they like. Then I would work on a cartoon, which is the full-size window, to be on a piece of paper as big as the window, and that could take me anywhere from a week to two weeks. I take this to the stained glass fabricator, and it could take them anywhere from a month to two to three months, depending on the size of the window, to actually fabricate it. And then the installation is a major event yes. in every congregation. Which will take several days. It's almost like the christening of a ship, probably. Oh, very much. Everybody comes out and, and wants to be a part of it. And, and is it important for them, it's, it's probably important for any church to have that feeling that this is their own and their own type of stained glass window, one of a kind. I'm I sure. would hope so. I would hope that each church would feel that the themes that they gave me then come through in their window, and then over the years, there's such a richness in the window, as it was expressed earlier, that every time you look at it, you'll see something new and something different. But that theme belongs to the church because they were the ones who set it. That's different from buying it out of a catalog and saying, I want one on page 22. <laughs> well, I'm sorry that we can't that we can't take page 23 and expand on it anymore. And I'm sorry to say that we're out of time for today. We're going to have to end the discussion on that note. And I want to thank both of you for being with us today. Thank you, Rachel. We enjoyed it. I want to thank Ben Heimsath and Mary Ann Heimsath for being with me today. And thank you all for joining us here on Austin Faith Dialogue. Please join us again next week for another edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Until then, peace. For more information, call Austin Metropolitan Ministries at 472-2000.